thank the FreeBSD Foundation for sending Deb down and organising all of this. It's um, fantastic having some more FreeBSD stuff going on down, down in, uh, in Australia and getting the love it deserves, so appreciate it. Um, yeah, so today uh, we've heard a lot of, um, I don't know about you, but I've had a lot of fun hearing about some of the technical stuff. So mine's going to be a bit more of a high level in terms of how we actually use FreeBSD in production workloads in practice um, in our cloud environment, and also how some of our uh, clients use it as well. Um, this one, I've, I wanted to start just with a, a quick dedication. Unfortunately, um, the, so the reason I'm only at this conference for two days is I'm actually going back to my dad's place in rural New South Wales to help him evacuate his house after this, which is fun. Um, but uh, the reason I brought it up here, uh, originally I was going to dedicate it to ZFS in kind of a, maybe a bit of black uh, humour there. Uh, when we were moving his stuff out in December, when the fires were less than 2Ks from his house, and it was pretty grim, um, we were worried about, oh, you know, do I pack the, uh, you know, do you pack family photos? Do you pack artwork? Like at some point it really helps you to evaluate your priorities in life. For me, it was easier. So, like, mate, I've got all of your stuff on your ZFS mirror on your FreeBSD micro server just there. Just pick that up, put that in the car, and we can go. Ignore everything else, and that's what we did. Um, so that was kind of cool. But I thought maybe putting dedicating it to that was uh, might have been a bit grim. So anyway, so but yeah, and also the um, fire service really helped a lot with that too. So it was a file system, and a, yeah, I don't know how you could say that tastefully. So maybe I won't. Um, one of the, I don't know if when people are doing uh, presentations and things, this is only the second one I've ever done and it probably already shows, um, but uh, when you're looking at people online and they say, these are the things you should never start a presentation with, you should never introduce yourself, you should never have an agenda or any of this sort of stuff. Um, so my name is Ruben. Uh, our agenda today is basically just give you a brief history of how I've used FreeBSD um, and introducing Orion VM quickly. Um, the sales guys want to talk about stuff. I'm going to try and keep that as brief as possible so I can get back to actually talking about how architecturally we use it. And then some of the examples where we actually use it in production workloads for some pretty large clients. Um, and then maybe we'll have a bit of a Q&A at the end and stuff uh, if we have time. Um, so basically, me, I'm a, so I'm, I guess you'd call a solution architect. I didn't know that that was a job title till about last year. So for most of my life, I was a sysadmin. Um, but then basically, sales guys need someone who can talk tech to people. Um, so I sort of tag along with the sales guys and help them. They say, oh, can your cloud do blah? Or can you do this? And I said, actually, yeah, and you should be putting this on FreeBSD. Oh, well, I've never heard of that before. And that's how I sort of get the foot, the foot in the door or the wedge. So basically, I advise clients on cloud deployments and stuff. Spend way too much of my life still doing Windows Server, but as much as I can, I try and get more of the BSD stuff. And then that's the stuff I do in my downtime. Uh, hats and coffee, etc. Um, so just before I get on to the, uh, uh, actually how we use it, this was the first machine that I ran FreeBSD on. So one of the real strengths of FreeBSD is how portable and reliable it is on a whole bunch of different architectures. So I actually ran the very first version of Mac OS X on here, and it was dreadful. Um, but it got me to use, I actually learned TCSH on it, the T, uh, TC, 10X C shell. Um, and yeah, I've, I remember running uh, Yellow Dog Linux on it originally, and for some reason it just had a, I can't remember what the driver problem was, but it just would not boot the damn thing. Incidentally, uh, for Fedora people, if you're used to, the Linux world and stuff, for ages you were using Yum. That was the Yellow Dog Update Manager. That's actually where that came from originally, was someone running um, uh, Fedora equivalent stuff on um, PowerPC. So, um, oh, geez, I left that weeb thing in there. Um, so I, I've been a, a FreeBSD user since uh, 2006. Um, I was going to put the screenshots in there showing my ghastly thing with Haruhi backgrounds and things from back in the day, but I thought copyright probably precludes that. Um, so yeah, originally I ran it on PowerPC, and then I guess naturally x86 and AMD64 was a, a, a sort of a progression from there. Um, and then basically I've been using FreeBSD professionally. It, same thing uh, with um, uh, before that uh, I was trying to come up with a way to use it professionally. Most of, of my work is still Linux and Windows Server, but I st have been finding more uses for FreeBSD, and it's just awesome. Um, and then hopefully eventually I aim to be a contributor at some point as well. Um, oh, I, I left that pun in that nomenclature, but that's, I'm at a Linux conference, and so you have to put a G for gnome. Um, 
This was something that I learned. To, I've been to two conferences now at Asia BSDCon in um, Tokyo, and this, ironically, was some of the stuff that was most helpful to me. When you're reading man pages and documentation, you're used to reading it, but no one ever says it. So I'm walking up to Alan Jew, like one of my gods, like basically one of the ZFS guys, lead maintainers, really nice guy, and I start talking about how I'm doing replication with ZFS using Geli, and he looks at me and he says, what? <laughs> Uh, jelly, I think, is what you're referring to. And I'm like, oh, well, that's embarrassing. Um, interesting, uh, our uh, company name as well, Orion VM, the number of times someone calls up saying Orion Vim, as if we invented the name Orion. I was like, I wish you know, we could take credit for that, but we didn't. Um, and then it was not, uh, it's not G-Nope, it's g -nope, from what I've been told. And uh, indeed, I was talk uh, Alan Jude was saying, yep, you've, you spelled, uh, you pronounced Geli as jelly, or the other way around, but you said ZFS, so you got half of it right. So I just thought, just throw that in there as a little thing if any of you are reading these things so you don't, uh, if you ever meet one of your idols, you don't make as much of a fool out of them as I did. Um, I'll be very quick here. Basically, this is, so this is the, uh, the company I work for. They paid me to be here, so I thought I'd better mention them in brief. Um, basically, we're a wholesale cloud provider. So what that means is um, if you want to sell a cloud of your own, you can rebadge ours and sell it as your own. So that flows through to things like, um, hey, I want to start Ruben, Joe Blogs, Ruben's uh, FreeBSD cloud. I only want the FreeBSD template enabled, maybe NetBSD, because I have a soft spot for that still as well, and maybe a PFSense template, et cetera, and turn everything else off. So it's really, we have a lot of uh, telcos. Um, we actually just signed Toshiba is using us. So part of the problem with having a wholesale cloud infrastructure is that um, if you've heard of us, it kind of means we haven't done our job properly. So there's actually a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes that does use our tech. Um, but obviously, they've put their brand in front of it. Anyway, that's, um, that'll keep the sales guys happy. In terms of our architecture, unfortunately, it does run Linux, um, but you know we can't win every battle. But basically, the way it works is we have a self-healing uh, replicated, I guess these days people call it hyper-converged, but we were sort of doing it a long time before that. Um, I put BSD here just because of all of the templates that you're running, you should be using that and maybe yeah, other things sparingly. Um, yeah, that's interesting. We, go, I, we do go to a lot of hypervisor conferences and stuff as well. And I remember there was, I'm blanking on the gentleman's name, but we were talking, we were comparing Beehive, because we do use Beehive for some stuff as well as Zen. And he said it's like uh, kicking a hornet's nest if you bring up one of these and talk about them. So I thought that was kind of a fun pun. Anyway, um, in terms of what it looks like, so this is just an example of our environment. And uh, just to give you an idea of, so we have FreeBSD, PFSense, I uh, don't think I've, oh no, I don't have a, um, uh, uh, another one of the things in there I want to show. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Anyway, yeah, so this get, just gives you an example of when someone is building stuff on our production environment. This is kind of what it looks like, kind of similar to an AWS sort of thing. Um, but then you get a drop down list of templates, and obviously FreeBSD uh, is one of them. So I guess the first of the three big things I wanted to just quickly touch on was on. Uh, how we use FreeBSD in production. And I guess the first and the biggest one is just as a guest. So we were, in fact, the first cloud in Australia to offer FreeBSD as a guest. Um, I remember that, thank you. Uh, <coughs> uh, remember DigitalOcean announced they were running open, uh, FreeBSD about a month after us, and they just killed all of our publicity on it. Because they're like, man, these guys are using it, and it's awesome. And we're like, yeah, but my FreeBSD side is like, this is awesome. It's going to get it in the hands of more people. And my Ryan side was like, yeah, um, obviously they have a much better sales team than we do. But um, I guess the key thing that sets us apart that I really like is, again, with trying not to be salesy about this stuff, but we consider FreeBSD the same class template as a Linux and Windows Server VM. So you're getting the same support for that as you would on other things. And it's interesting that the number of times people want an Ubuntu VM because they've heard of it. Or, and they, their boss has heard of it. And so one of the pain points for a lot of this is when people want to deploy a FreeBSD template or something, or they want to offer that as something that they can provide their customers, they want the assurance that it's supported, that there's long-term support for these sort of things. So then I go down the spiel of saying, well, there's five years of support for the 0.0 releases for things, and this is how this works. Oh, and by the way, we offer the same level of support as we do for Linux as well. So it's interesting how many of these discussions we have where I would say almost, not always, but very often the, uh, 
technical reasons aren't as important as the appearance of it. So if you can appease people and bring them on, then you can, um, uh, you can bring them on board. And basically, I just wanted to call out Colin Percival as well for his, um, his inspiring work with getting it running on AWS. A lot of his stuff I may have um, pillaged to get it working on us as well. Um, just to, in case anyone's interested, basically we run root on ZFS by default. So when you install FreeBSD, one of the options is, I believe the default is still UFS2, but you can choose to run it with ZFS. I don't see any downside to it and a huge number of upsides. I actually have some slides later explaining open ZFS, but I think, I think everyone's been sold on it by this date, so we probably don't, don't need to go into much detail. Um, I track the releases. Um, we've had a couple of people request some stable and current ones just to say, can you just gen these for me? Um, looking into potentially doing something like that. But for now, it's easy enough just to say, get yourself on a release and then it's easy enough to update. Um, yourself. And I actually did a work in progress session at Asia BSD Con um, earlier last year where I talked about some of the pipeline stuff that I did to get all that working if, um, if anyone's interested. And in terms of guests, I mean, these are the best of breed in all of their industries as far as I'm concerned. If you need storage, you put it on. You can, in fact, you could put it on FreeBSD, but FreeNAS is excellent. It has a beautiful UI, especially some of the recent versions is fantastic. And if you're demoing it to someone, particularly now that I do so much of this sales stuff, I show it to someone saying, this is what your storage is running on. And they say, yep, this looks legit. And they tick the box. And I was like, I want to tell you and show you all these awesome features it has. And say, no, I don't care. It looks fine. Yeah. And then they move on. So it's, it's, a, it's amazing how often a bit of spit and polish helps. And PFSense, of course, I'll talk a little bit about later too. Um, I'll touch very briefly on this, but basically the uh, Azure BSD com. I talked a little bit about how we, were, we got the uh, template system working. So basically we've got it to the point now on our platform, if you provision an Orion v a provision Orion VM, if you provision a FreeBSD template on Orion VM, kind of like an AMI, you can, live, you can now live attach and detach block devices, ISO images, NICs, sub-interfaces, IP addresses, gateways, pub keys, et cetera, which is really useful if you've got something like ZFS and you're running out of space, you just live attach another disk, add it to your pool, and you're done, um, which is really nice. Um, some future plans, though, I do want to work a bit better on getting some of the uh, ZFS stuff uh, better integrated, so then it's doing the auto-scaling if you expand a disk live on the platform as well, um, and some more binary tools and things. So I guess the, we've heard a lot about of technical stuff, but I thought it would be useful also just to briefly mention just why we should use it or consider it. Because be, this being a Linux conference, some people might not have considered it. I know when I started Orion, this, it's the same attitude in most places. It's like, yeah, I've kind of heard of it, and it looks pretty cool, but I've never had a reason to use it. So um, actually, this is the closest I have to a name drop is when I met Alan Jude uh, earlier this year, I was like, can I get a picture with you? He's like, mm, okay. So he, he was very gracious, and I was pulling the most awkward pose in the history of time. But um, this was, I, I said, how, how do you approach this coming from a Linux person? And he recited something very similar to he did, that he did at a, um, I think it was web hosting talk, the website. I can't remember. Someone was asking him that, and he said, FreeBSD can pretty much do everything Linux can, and most of the things it does better. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, f I figured if I attribute it to him, you can hurl anger at him instead of me. But actually, for the most part, it's true. Um, pretty much every workload that, uh, that someone's asked, should I run Linux with this? And I say, have you considered FreeBSD? And the, the main concerns that people seem to have is not necessarily that it's not technically capable, but they don't have the internal experience. And they said, okay, we need, maybe we need to do some training or we need to sort out some things like that. So it's Time and time again, it's actually the soft skill and the impressions that people have of the system versus actually the technical stuff, which is, I guess, being this new role I've been for, for about 12 months or so has been probably the most eye-opening thing. Um, there's also a lot of what I would consider unhelpful advice, as in people who are offering something which is factually true and completely unhelpful. Um, you go on to Stack Overflow and these kind of things. These websites are just full of comments like this, which are well-meaning and correct, but not particularly helpful. So the most common one that uh, when people say, oh, I'm a Linux person, I'm thinking of trying BSD, they say, well, is security a concern? Well, then go with these guys. Is portability a concern? Go with this. Of course, it's, for the most part, not that useful because it turns out OpenBSD, for example, is really good on laptops. NetBSD runs really well on AMD64. And FreeBSD 
PF sensors a kick-ass security appliance that runs on it. So these, having these buckets I don't think is particularly useful. So, um, and then also the, the, the other comment where people say, well, Linux is just a kernel, FreeBSD is a complete system. In isolation by itself, I hear that. I even see that in footers. People put that on their messaging lists and things like that. What does that actually mean in practice? Um, so I can speak from my experience, but basically pretty much what up until this point we've seen the slides of people talking today. Basically, I think it is a mature, high-quality operating system. The thing, the, the message we've heard so many times is that you know, the, you, you're very rarely surprised by anything that happens in FreeBSD. And if something does surprise you, chances are it's surprised a lot of other people, and you can go on to a mailing list or something and get or IRC and get an answer pretty quickly. And there's a really core small team of people who are really know their stuff and are willing to help you, even like when I started using it back in 2006, and I was asking the greenest questions imaginable, and people still took the time to help me out. Um, and I think the other big one there in terms of um, that is just the documentation. I remember I was troubleshooting, I was at a remote site and I was looking at a, a um, uh, I don't even know if you say CentOS or CentOS these days anymore, but uh, one of, the, however you pronounce that, and I was looking in the man page for something and it said refer to uh, GNU info. How that can pass for quality documentation just blows my mind. So, you look up the man pages, you look up the documentation, the handbook for FreeBSD, it is really, really good. Um, or maybe just my standards are lower since using uh, less good stuff. But um, the, the reason I have Tux on the slide though as well is that one thing I think gets overlooked in a lot of this stuff is that the BSD community benefits from Linux and Linux benefits from FreeBSD. There's the, so the attitude of, um, uh, you know, they have to lose for us to win. On my FreeBSD desktop at home, I run XFCE, like it's, which is licensed under the GPL. I use GCC for some stuff, which is obviously GNU stuff. And then they run OpenSSH, which comes from the OpenBSD project. And they now, we're even merging together our efforts for OpenZFS as well. I say the royal way, I'm not uh, intelligent enough to help with that. But um, we're act it's, it is a community that we can all use and contribute to. So I think we kind of don't really do ourselves a favor by going and, and comparing to ourselves like that and um, taking us down. I think we're, the, it's, um, it's counterproductive. So um, this, this section, the, the icon got a bit uh, messed up there is about uh, OpenZFS, so I don't feel like I need to, to probably go into too much detail about this. But basically, this is what we use uh, on our platform for a lot of stuff. OpenZFS is the industry standard for file systems, um, as far as I'm concerned. There really is no credible alternative. Um, we've, I've, I say this from experience, having rebuilt a ton of ButterFS arrays in my life at this stage to know that I don't want to touch that ever again if I can avoid it. It's, it's good, but it, being good is not good enough in terms of file systems. Um, I, I, think it was, uh, I think it was Benedict uh, uh, who was giving me, uh, Benedict Reuschling is one of the um, people in, in the uh, uh, FreeBSD project in the um, in his stuff was saying that there are a lot of things where if you have slightly slower performance, that's one thing. If you have, you know, if the, if the UI isn't quite right, that's another thing. You screw up the tiniest bit of data and people will not trust you forever. So the stakes are so much higher for this stuff. So the fact that we have this system, it's trustworthy, we use it. And now that we have the Z ZFS on Linux and the Illumos teams all contributing together uh, with FreeBSD, I think it's just a win for everyone, which is awesome. Um, it also, I, I mentioned these things in terms of features, which I guess is kind of redundant at this stage, but you get so much cool stuff out of the box with OpenZFS. Compression, deduping, snapshots, all out of the box. Um, I don't know if anyone, has anyone here heard of the um, uh, Trim document management system before? Yeah, a few people, yeah. So we had, we are actually working with a, a client that was doing a lot of stuff for the, uh, for the Queensland government actually. And they were trying to import a bunch of stuff off that onto a new system. And one of the things, I, this is second-hand knowledge, but he was saying basically that this document management system, the way it would store a change for a file is to duplicate the file. I'm not sure if that's still the case, but a few years ago that was what they were telling me. And so the problem is, their theory was that um, if you're a hardware vendor and you want to sell more hardware, how do you sell more hardware? You store copies like 
byte-sized changes in files. You don't save a diff, just copy the file twice, and then the drives will run out of space, and they'll come crying for more storage, and then they can buy more off you, and then everyone's happy. So what he was able to do was actually redeploy that on some uh, um, open ZFS stuff running on FreeBSD as VMs on our platform. He didn't even turn deduping on. He just ran LZ4 on that because um, he was concerned that maybe the, the memory requirements and stuff for deduping would be too much and it would, it would be slow. Turns out it wasn't and he was able to do that as well. But just using LZ4 cut more than 95% of his storage down. So for him, the fact that we were you know, cheaper and faster and easier than other clouds and things like that, that's, that's all fine. He didn't really care. It was just he knew that there was someone internally who had expertise in FreeBSD and could help him deploy it, and he didn't have to go and buy an entire new storage array. Um, unfortunately, he, I think he was also thinking of get, getting some HP gear, and from the Australian tax office, we can see how sometimes that might not be such a good idea. So, um, but then the question then inevitably comes up, well, if ZFS is now also on Linux, or you know, we're all contributing upstream and things like that, why would I run FreeBSD for it if this is a compelling file system choice? And it's a reasonable question. Um, if we're all contributing the same stuff now, there's this market differentiation which theoretically might not exist anymore. The main benefit still with FreeBSD is it has excellent integration with all of this stuff through every part of the system. Um, I think, do I have a... Yeah, I have a second slide on this. So just as a couple of examples, so um, if, you, if you're building your own ports, uh, you basically want the system that you can use to do that uses ZFS. The nice thing there is it will take a snapshot and then you can blow away your system and then you're, that way you're always starting with a clean version when you're building stuff, which mitigates a lot of problems. IO Cage, which is a, a popular tool that people use to manage jails, uses ZFS by default and Easy Jail, I, I don't think uses it by default, but it's an option. So... Uh, and actually, yeah, Alan Jude also demonstrated using Atomic Upgrades again at um, Azure BSDCon, and he's got those papers up on the website. Anyway, these are just examples uh, of the fact that it's much more a part of the system uh, on FreeBSD still. It's not a attack on. And unfortunately, dare I say, with the, the sort of the concerns around the GPL and things like that, I think it does have a future in Linux, and I'm excited. But Linus Torvalds, I'm not sure if you saw the news a few days ago, said no one should use ZFS. So there's still obviously a, a huge hurdle that we have to overcome there. But in the meantime, it's tested, it's reliable, it's dependable, it's fast on FreeBSD, so why would you not use it? Um, in terms of just, I guess, how we use it, basically, yeah, by default, we have uh, FreeBSD and FreeNAS templates on our platform. And, and from a hosting perspective, we also deploy it on bare metal if people want it as well. The cool thing about it is basically we've just gone 100% ZFS everywhere. I remember in the early days, I think in FreeBSD 9, we had UFS as a template option, and I don't think anyone ever deployed it. <laughs> it was just sitting there, and it's like, so by default, it was um, uh, UFS, but people were still deploying the, um, the, uh, the ZFS version. And again, I say, again, why not? Just give it a try. So, um, and uh, yeah, basically, I, I didn't really mention it in the previous slide, but one of the things that our platform can do, which is kind of cool, is our cloud offering and the bare metal basically operate all on the same layer two network. Um, I'm not a network engineer, so I couldn't explain to you how that works, but basically it means that if you've got a, a free NAS array, either a physical one or a virtual one, you could export that over NFS or Samba or whatever else you want to do, and then uh, use HAST for replication or, uh, or, or using um, uh, ZFS send receive, and you can basically get exactly the kind of topology you want, um, which is uh, really nice. So basically, this is just an example of, of um, where we use it in production. So imagine you've got a client in Sydney who's using our, our, our um, infrastructure uh, to run uh, servers, etc. You've got a free BSD guest, you're running HAST replication, you've got uh, Jelly, Gelly, doing your encryption, open ZFS on top of that, and then you've got your PFSense on either side uh, providing the VPN tunnels and things like that. Or if you had an MPLS link, potentially, you could be uh, going through that um, as well. Um, I think, yeah, that's kind of also covered that. I guess the, the last kind of slightly more interesting thing was our partnership with Tidal Scale. So 
Uh, I wasn't involved directly with this. This was the American team uh, in San Francisco who was working on this. So we did start as an Australian company, but we do have, a, we do have some uh, people in the US as well. Um, basically, we've taken the idea of doing like a, a VM where you would split up a server into multiple VMs, sort of turn that on its head, and you have se several physical boxes operating one monstrously big VM. Well, why would you want to do that? But you can do things like a huge in-memory databases, uh, mainframe workloads can go onto it, and again, FreeBSD just makes that so simple. Um, and of course, we use Beehive to do that um, with RDMA over 10G Ethernet and stuff. And it means that we can scale up to 13 terabytes of memory and hundreds of virtual CPUs. We actually, I think, uh, I think he's actually at the event, but one of our kernel developers, in fact, found a bug in an early implementation of um, Beehive where we were, oh, it wasn't a bug, but we were limited to 64 virtual CPUs. And we were saying, we're, we're hitting that already. Can you guys give us some more? And so they um, worked some things out, which is kind of cool. Um, yeah, I guess we're, we've, we've probably all heard of PFSense. Um, this is probably my, this will, where I'll be uh, finishing up. But basically, we, we have a few different uh, appliances on the platform, but PFSense just makes it so easy for people to be able to provision and deploy um, security on their cloud environments. And again, if you have a PFSense virtual server sitting somewhere and you've got some physical boxes somewhere else, maybe Oracle wants you to run on some specific hardware, you can have that there and then using the layer two network um, up to PFSense and then let that handle all of your filtering and traffic, et cetera. Um, also, you could also use, just use IPFW on FreeBSD. And I guess the cool reason that this is able to happen is um, one of the advantages, I guess, on our platform is we don't do any double matting. So if you have a public IP on the Orion VM portal or one of our resellers, for example, that IP is the public IP on the NIC for that VM. So you're not going through a 172 or any of that nonsense that some of the other ones do. It's actually directly on there, which makes configuring it and setting it up a lot easier. And so PFSense is just a, a natural fit. I guess we kind of saw that diagram already. Um, yeah, so I guess in summary, there wasn't that much technical stuff in there, but I thought maybe that's just an idea of some of the things you can use it for. We, yeah, we use it in production every day, and it's rock solid. Um, it's, we use, yeah, so we use FreeNAS for storage, OpenZFS. It's fantastic, um, FreeNAS, and... Um, yeah, I think that's that's us. Oh, uh, yeah, and then we've used that tidal scale system to deploy those larger size VMs and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to briefly call out and say thanks again to the FreeBSD Foundation and for the everyone um, at the Linux Conf for setting this up and to be able to do that. It's really fantastic. Um, if you're interested in FreeBSD and you want to get started and you don't really know where, check out the BSD Now podcast. Um, Alan Juden and, and um, Benedict Reuschling do this each week, I believe, and they just have a candid discussion about some of the news that's going on, and they sometimes do deep dives and things in this stuff, which is really useful. Um, and then, obviously, yeah, if you're interested in... Uh, Michael Dexter is a name that comes up a lot um, in the hypervisor circles, but he also does some fundraising things as well. And, yeah, and basically just wanted to call out and say thanks to PFSense and um, OpenZFS and the foundation as well. So, um, yeah, I think that's... Well, that's boring legal stuff. I think that's all we've got time for. But yeah, anyway, I appreciate your time. Thank you very much.